Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 123, The History of the Russian Orthodox Church, Part 4. The music you just listened to was known as Small Doxology, or Hymn, from an unknown choir in Russia. Last time, we covered the period between the death of Peter the Great in 1725 and the series of holy synods, to the dawn of the Bolshevik Revolution and the time of the last Tsar, Nicholas II. This will be the final part of our four-part story on the history of the Russian Orthodox Church. It is 1894, and the reluctant Nicholas takes the throne after the unexpected death of his father, Alexander III. Nicholas's attitude that, as Daniel Shubin comments on in his book, The History of Russian Christianity, Part 4, was that he, quote, felt like he was anointed of God, selected to be more than an orthodox king, more than a Russian emperor, and was destined to emulate Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich of the 17th century. With such a temperament, the new Tsar would have normalized imperial ecclesiastical relations if he had surrounded himself with competent supporters. The primary flaw of Tsar Nicholas was that he was unable to discern the motives of people. He often failed to trust the trustworthy and relied on those who were disreputable and unreliable. In 1904, Nicholas put out a decree allowing for the freedom of worship within Russia, among other reforms. But, as usual, it was held up by that old conservative, Konstantin Pobodonetsev. As he put it, quote, The decree of December 12, 1904, is not directed toward the guarantee of freedom of worship, but only to toleration in matters of confession. The Orthodox Church remains reverently honored, preeminent, and official. The Church response was even stronger, given by Metropolitan Antoni Vadkovsky. Quote, The Orthodox Church does not even possess the freedoms that are now supposed to be rewarded to those other churches and denominations. What the Church wanted was a return to a patriarchal system, doing away with the Holy Synod. Of course, Mr. Anti-Reform Pobodonetsov would have none of this, and he was the most powerful man in the Synod as Attorney General. He viewed the time of the patriarchs as, quote, mortified ritualistic formalism. The head of the Committee of Ministers, though, Sergei Witte, he opposed Pobodonetsov in this matter. Metropolitan Vadkovsky saw his opening and submitted a report directly to Tsar Nicholas. Here is what he proposed. 1. To recognize that departure from the Orthodox faith into another Christian faith or denomination is not subject to persecution and should not be accompanied by any deprivation of personal or civil rights. 2. To open all houses of worship that have been closed as a result of administrative orders. Three to remove administrative orders that suppress the rights of old believers and sectarians in regard to their service in the empire of society. They also began to set up the idea of bringing back the patriarchate as another event conspired to put down the opposition from Pope of the Netzloff. On October 17, 1905, an imperial edict created the State Duma, which turned Russia into a constitutional monarchy. Pobodonetsov was forced to retire. But, if you think that things would get better, this was to be disastrous to the Russian Orthodox Church, as the next ten men to serve as in the Attorney General's position in the following twelve years were terribly weak, ineffective, or supporters of one Grigory Efimovich Rasputin. But before we get to the notorious mystic Rasputin, we must deal with another man, Father Georgi Gapon. Father Gapon, as you may remember from way back in episode 62, was the leader of an estimated 30,000 Russian citizens who wanted to present a plea to the Tsar asking for higher wages and better conditions for workers in St. Petersburg. On January 9, 1905, as he and his followers, many carrying religious icons and pictures of the Tsar, approached the Winter Palace, which, by the way, the Tsar wasn't even in, troops fired upon the crowd, killing about 200 and wounding 800. 
This day was to be known to history as Bloody Sunday. It was also a day that many of the Russian people lost most of their respect for the Tsar and helped create more revolutionaries demanding an end to Romanov rule. But one man would damage the reputation of Nicholas more than Gapon or Pobodonetsov, and that would be Rasputin. Known as a Staritz, or elder, Rasputin would weave his way up through Russian society and have a large influence on the Tsar, especially through his wife, Zarina Alexandra Fyodorovna. The man, as Shubin puts it, led a double life. Quote, in the morning, Rasputin could be found in the private company of a prostitute who he had propositioned on the streets of St. Petersburg, while later, that same day, he might be at Tsarskoye Selo, healing the Zarevich Alexis of his hemophilia and acting as a divine counselor to the royal parents. Rasputin's influence came at a time when Russia was suffering from the effects of the disastrous World War I. 3,300,000 Russians would die in the war, and when Nicholas took control of the war effort, Rasputin would begin to put his so-called friends into places of power within the Russian Orthodox Church. Attorney General after Attorney General tried to oppose Rasputin, but time and time again, either the Tsar or Tsarina would step in and side with their friend. Many prelates tried to expose Rasputin as a charlatan and fraud, but were rebuffed. On June 16, 1914, Kionya Guseva tried to kill him with a knife because she saw him as a false prophet, even accusing him of being the Antichrist. Another person, the monk Ilyador Trufanov, tried to conspire to assassinate Rasputin, but was found out and fled to Finland, Norway, and lastly to the United States, and he had written a book entitled The Holy Devil. Rasputin was murdered by Prince Felix Yusupov on December 17, 1916, but the damage to the reputation of the Tsar was done. But the re reputation of the Russian Orthodox Church suffered greatly as well, causing many to leave the Church, or at least question its place in society in their lives. Now, I'm not going to go any further into Rasputin because I'm going to devote an entire podcast, at least in the future, sometime soon, on Rasputin, who I find to be one of the most interesting characters in human history, much less Russian history. While the nation was in turmoil, the church went on its merry way discussing a return to the patriarchal system as if it would magically fix the problems they faced. Following Nicholas II's abdication in March of 1917, the provisional government, then led by Lvov, fired most of the members of the Holy Synod, some of whom were allies of Rasputin. But Lvov was removed from office, and by August 5, 1917, the Holy Synod was eliminated completely. By this time, the relationship between the rotating and hard-to-work-with bishops and the parish clergy were frayed beyond repair. Edicts sent down from the top members of the ROC were oftentimes ignored. Some local clergy would chase bishops out of town, while some bishops resorted to force or the threat of force on the local priests. The church was on the brink of dissolution at this point in history. But what was to come next would be the biggest threat it would ever face, the Bolsheviks. The church hierarchy, somehow not seeing the threat, convened a meeting when news came of the overthrow of the government and the power grabbed by Lenin and his people. Immediately, they responded by voting on and passing the idea of creating a patriarchate. On November 21, 1917, Patriarch Tikhon was ordained as the 12th Patriarch of Moscow and all of Russia. These men of the church hierarchy were horribly narrow-minded and overly confident that that whatever government would take over, they would have a large influence on things because of their power over the people. How terribly deluded they were. Lenin despised the church, as he felt that they worked lockstep in line with the ruling class in suppressing the people of Russia. As the motto of the hated Alexander III was, nationalism, aristocracy, orthodoxy. It was natural for Lenin to view the Russian Orthodox Church as a threat to his power grab. According to Shubin, 
Whenever Lenin talked about religion in Russia, he was directly talking about the ROC as he felt other religions were incidental and unimportant in his country. In Lenin's eyes, the church is what held back the Russian people and stifled its economy by perpetrating myths and stealing wealth from the people and spending it on elaborate churches and monasteries. At the time, few could argue against that position, as many in the people in the countryside had similar feelings. As I mentioned in the previous podcasts on the church, there was rampant alcoholism by priests, monks, and nuns, which was not controlled by the hierarchy of the church. Being a devout atheist, Lenin believed that if they raised the educational bar for the Russian people, they would abandon their belief in God, just as they would abandon the Russian Orthodox Church. His idea had merit on the surface, but it would never come to fruition, as the people, despite brutal suppression, never would give up their belief in God. Instead, it would be hidden deep in their homes and hearts. From here, Lenin ordered the persecution of the ROC and began systematically closing churches and monasteries, but did it rather slowly. The reason for it was the multitude of other problems facing the Bolsheviks, like a stagnant economy, the civil war, and starvation throughout Russia. What they did do quickly, though, was confiscate all church property and wealth, and set forth an edict that the church could no longer charge for performing rites, which basically took away all their income. But was rather curious here, the Bolsheviks supported the idea of the patriarch being the head of the ROC, knowing that it would be difficult to completely shut down the church and getting intense heat from the world leaders regarding the restrictions on the church, they left some churches open, primarily in Belarus and Ukraine. By 1939, with Stalin in power, there's only about 500 churches remaining open, with no monasteries, convents, or seminaries left. This was down from 78,000 churches and 1,000 monasteries, convents, and seminaries at the dawn of the revolution in 1917. When they confiscated the wealth of the Russian Orthodox Church, the Bolsheviks were stunned by the amount of money that they came into. In St. Petersburg alone, they were able to get their hands on over 2 million rubles. The church was powerless to resist, and furthermore, the Soviets decided to pit top prelate after, against other prelates, promising the winners that they would be allowed to rule over what remained of the church and would be immune from persecution, arrest, and death. The church hierarchy caved in easily. Pavel Milukov, who wrote much about the ROC, had this to say about the church when the Soviets took over. Quote, the revolution met the Russian church in a state of disarray. It would not have been otherwise, of course, taking into consideration all that we know about it. The immutability of dogma, administrative control over its religious facets, ritualism, the indifference of the masses to the spiritual content of the religion, all of this place the religion in a complete contrast to revolutionary ideas. During Pobodonetsev's and Sabler's tenure, the influence of imperial authority and its protective ideology penetrated throughout the sphere of ecclesiastical life and finally paralyzed all living branches of spirituality. The reign of terror on the church and its cl clergy during the beginning phases of the revolution and civil war was in full swing. The first one to be executed was Ion Kocherov on November 8, 1917 in St. Petersburg. The proto-priest was definitely in the wrong place at the wrong time, as he was actually from Chicago. The church hierarchy finally went into a state of panic. A letter from the ROC Regional Council was sent to the Kremlin. It said, quote, Enough blood of our brethren has been shed, enough malice and vengeance shown. There is no place on this earth for vengeance. Victors, whoever you are, and whoever's name you are fighting, do not defile yourselves further by spilling the blood of your brethren, by murdering the defenseless. Do not add further sorrow and shame to our fractured homeland, already drenched with the blood of its own sons. 
considering their unfortunate mothers and families, and do not add more tears and sobbing by increasing the bloodshed. Even you, who deny God and his church, stop for the sake of humanity. The Council also calls to you, the leaders of this movement, to utilize your influence to restrain the bloodthirsty drive of those who are drunk from the victory of their fratricide. It should come no surprise to you that this was probably laughed off by the Soviets, as there was far more bloodshed to come. All over Russia, as the Civil War raged on, mass protests were held to fight the Soviet seizure of church property and materials. Monks, priests, and parishioners alike were murdered in response. Thousands were killed. Obviously, this led to the church to support the whites in the war. On February 5, 1918, the Soviets decreed that the church and state were now officially separate. The decree made it clear that there was to be an adversarial relationship between the two institutions. At this time, many members of the church would flee Russia. Some headed to Mongolia, then China, through Japan, and to the United States. I met many a priest who took that route during my childhood. Others headed to Europe with a large contingency setting themselves up in the south of France. I spent a month at a Russian Orthodox camp in Caen in 1970, where I met quite a large number of emigres and some of them members of the Romanov family. Some went to Serbia, which is where my family headed to. This diaspora led to the founding of Russian Orthodox communities like the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, known as Rokor, which I belong to with its headquarters in Manhattan and New York City. Another splinter group is the OCA, or Orthodox Church of America, based in Syosset, New York, which traces back to the time that Russia held Alaska. Within Russia, those who chose to stay behind were being executed all over the country. The royal family and numerous relatives and friends were shot, drowned, or otherwise murdered. Patriarch Tikhon was arrested, after which he urged all remaining prelates to cease any political activities and to submit to the authority of the Soviets. This was done primarily to protect those in areas that were under control of the White Army that was disintegrating rapidly. Any priests, bishops, or even metropolitans who sided with the enemies of the Soviets were hung or shot. Many fled the country. On April 7, 1925, Patriarch Tikhon passed away. He was canonized on November 1, 1981, as Saint Tikhon. He was replaced by Ivan Nikolaevich Strogorodsky, also known as Patriarch Sergius I. Sergius tried to convince the Soviets that the Church was loyal to the government to try to stop the slaughter of priests, bishops, and metropolitans. It didn't work. During the period from 1925 through 1940, church documents record that 168,300 Russian Orthodox clergy, which includes monks and nuns, were arrested. Of those, some estimates say there were over 100,000 were shot, but there's conflicting information about this as one source claimed that only 50,000 were executed. But whatever the truth is, the suffering of the faithful was extreme. And then came the invasion of the Nazis in June of 1941. Strange as this may be, the invasion of the Soviet Union can almost be thought of as a savior of the Russian Orthodox Church, as the Church had an ability to rouse the people in a way that the Soviets could not, and because Stalin wanted Western help. The West viewed the persecution of the members of the Church with great disdain, so Stalin met with church elders and ordered that the churches be tolerated and allowed to reopen. So many of them did, as well as monasteries. By 1957, 22,000 churches were open in the Soviet Union. But then came Nikita Khrushchev. Premier Khrushchev ordered that the churches should be closed and that the ROC was still a threat to the Soviet state and to Marxism-Leninism. During his time as Supreme Soviet leader, 
Khrushchev had over 15,000 churches closed and had numerous prelates arrested and sent to gulags. By 1965, there were only 7,000 churches left open. When Brezhnev came to power, the Soviet government realized the persecution of Christians wasn't working and it was time to lay off some of the pressure. Instead, they worked hard at getting the members of the hierarchy to become servants of the state, a.k.a. join the KGB and spy on their fellow prelates. According to the Mitrohin archive and other sources, all of the men to become patriarch over the years, like Alexei I and II, Piman, and the current patriarch, Kirill, had ties to the KGB. While it's very likely to be true, did they really have a choice in the matter? They did it to save the church, which they accomplished, as with the ascension of Mikhail Gorbachev as the supreme leader of the Soviet Union in 1985 shows. He relaxed the laws against the church and allowed them to openly practice their faith for the first time since 1917. When the celebration of the 1,000th anniversary of Orthodoxy in Russia on June 5th through the 12th, 1988 came about, it was the largest one in the history of the church. In 1990, Gorbachev passed an edict that said, quote, Religious organizations that are registered in the normal, legal manner can provide religious education of children and adults, create religious schools and groups, and also provide religious education in other forms. As of 2010, the church has 160 dioceses, including 30,142 parishes, served by 207 bishops, 28,434 priests, and 3,625 deacons. There are 788 monasteries, including 386 for men and 402 for women. It had come back from the grave that Lenin, Stalin, Khrushchev, and Brezhnev had dug for them. Today, there are deep ties between the Putin administration and the Russian Orthodox Church. Putin is using the ties to pass laws like the anti-gay bill recently and to persecute those who oppose him. The church is rather open to supporting Putin in his conservative, pro-Russian stance, going so far as to describe the Putin era as a miracle of God. Now for just a little bit about the two major Russian Orthodox organizations outside of Russia. The first and the smallest one is the Orthodox Church of America, known as the OCA. It has about 85,000 members with a little over 30,000 regular attendees of church. It became autonomous only in 1970, but its beginnings can be traced way back to the 1700s when Siberian fur traders spread orthodoxy to the natives in Alaska. On November 20th, 1920, Patriarch Tikhon formally authorized Russian Orthodox bishops to set up temporary independent organizations, which this church did. The second is the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, known as Rokor. On September 13, 1922, Russian Orthodox leaders met in Serbia in the town of Sremsky Kolovici and established a synod of bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church abroad, the foundation of Rokor. From here, in 1927, Rokor declared, quote, the part of the Russian Orthodox Church that finds itself abroad considers itself an inseparable, spiritually united branch of the great Russian Church. It doesn't separate itself from its mother church and doesn't consider itself autocephalous. It was now officially the voice of all Russian Orthodox churches outside of Russia. And this is the church I was baptized into in 1958, as well as my two daughters. It currently has about 400,000 members and about 400 parishes worldwide, 139 of them being in the United States. The current head, Metropolitan Hilarion, was a close friend of my family when he was a bishop in the 1960s and 70s. He actually considered my mother to be his mother. After heated debate in 2007, the church decided to reconcile with the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia. Part of the fight was the KGB connection with the hierarchy of the heads of the church. While autonomous, Rokor is remaining this way, but they have rejoined 
after being apart from each other since 1922. Now, next time, I'm going to be telling you about the great rebellions that racked Russia from between 1600 and 1800, based on a book authored by my Russian history professor, Dr. Paul Average. Interestingly enough, the book was published the year I took his first course in 1976. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Don't forget to visit the website at www.russianrulershistory.com or come join our Facebook group at Russian Rulers History Podcast where you can ask a question, leave a comment, maybe make a suggestion. But as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.